this evening, uh, we turn to a new book. We're going to open up together the book of Jonah. So if you would turn with me to Jonah chapter 1. Uh, Jonah chapter 1, I would encourage you, uh, I'm going to have uh, two weeks off after this, and so we're only going to be looking at the first three verses of this book. And I would encourage you, if you have time uh, in your personal devotions, that you would take time to read through uh, this short book several times. It will help you as we study it together. It's only... Uh, Four very short chapters, three pages in your Bible. It's uh, shorter than some newspaper articles, and we would not hesitate to read them. So take some time to read uh, the prophecy of Jonah. It will will help you as we uh, move through it together. This morning, what we're going to do is we're or this evening rather, what we're going to do is we're going to look at only the first three verses of uh, Jonah chapter one. And what I want to do just by way of giving us some context, is read the first 17 verses together. So we'll read verses 1 through 17. We're going to only look at verses 1 through 3. So Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, and we'll be looking specifically at verse 1 through 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. But Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid, and each cried cried out to his God, And they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said one to another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know on whose account this evil has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to get back to dry land. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. Therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life, and lay not on us innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows." And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. So far the reading from God's Word this evening. Well, most, if not all, of us here adhere to the teaching that the Bible is God's inspired Word. It is uh, the very breathed out thoughts of the Lord for His people. And when we hold the Bible in that kind of regard... That puts us at odds with uh, those who would like to be critical of the Word of God. Those who would say that the Bible is just a series of stories written down by man. That it's full of errors. That it's, uh, in some cases, even simply just a fairy tale. Because when we say that the Bible is the very embodiment of truth that has implications, and the most significant implication would be probably be that Jesus was a a true man who walked on the earth, who gave up his life uh, for his people. 
the fact that Jesus was a real historical figure is not necessarily controversial. Even uh, atheist scholars of the Bible would believe that. They would uh, recognize that Jesus was a real person. But faith in the Word of God also uh, means that you believe in creation by God's Word, that you believe in talking snakes, that you believe in donkeys who are given the ability to talk, that you believe in the miracles of Jesus, and that you believe in Jonah in the belly of the big fish, perhaps one of the issues that causes great mockery in the eyes of those who would reject the truth of God's Word. What we want to do over the next several weeks is take a look at this unique prophecy. Jonah is, uh, make no mistake, Jonah is a very unique prophecy. Other prophets typically deal with the preaching or teaching ministry of a man of God, at least primarily the words that the Lord laid on this man to declare uh, to his people. Uh, they write them down and, and the Lord sets forth his will to man. Uh, Jonah's verbal prophecy is very short. Eight little words in Jonah chapter 3 and verse 4. Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's the extent of the verbal prophecy that is recorded in this short uh, book. So God's will for his people is understood not so much from the words that Jonah speaks as it is from his actions. Jonah serves as something of a picture for the people of God, a way to understand how the people of God are to interact with him. It's more biography than sermon, really. And so in his biography, in the biography of Jonah, limited as it is, we learn as God's people how we are to interact with him. Now, before we begin to look at these verses. We want to get a little bit of background on Jonah. We don't know that much about Jonah, but we know a little bit. In 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 25, the same Jonah, the son of Amittai, appears also during the reign of Jeroboam II, one of the kings of the northern kingdom. And during the reign of Jeroboam II, he predicted the restoration of the boundaries of the northern kingdom's borders. And it came true according to the prophecy of Jonah, the son of Amittai. In 2 Kings, we also know that he was from a place called gath Hefer. It's a town of a little consequence in the territory of Zebulun. Zebulun was a tribe in the far north of uh, the, even the kingdom of the northern tribes. It was, uh, when you look at the map of, of Israel and and, uh, and and Canaan and, and those, those, those countries around that area, you have the Sea of Galilee, that little circle at the top, right? And then you have the Red Sea at the bottom of it. Well, uh, where, where Jonah was from was kind of parallel with the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. It was far in the north of the kingdom of Israel. It's really only a couple of miles from Nazareth, the place where Jesus was born in, in Galilee, centuries later, of course. And that's what we know of Jonah. We don't know anything else about him. We know that he prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II, and we don't know but eight words that he prophesied during his ministry as a prophet of the Lord. And as we turn to this book, which is mostly a picture, uh, people have used this picture as something to ridicule the truth of the Word of God. It seems uh, to unregenerate man as a fanciful book. There are many problems within it, and we will deal with them in turn, but you have Jonah in the belly of the great fish, as we read together this morning. You have uh, the size of the city of Nineveh. Later on, it will be described as needing a three-day journey to cross through Nineveh. And we know from excavations that it was probably no more than eight miles across. Uh, we know of the gourd that springs up in the wilderness as Jonah waits for Nineveh to be destroyed. We know of the worm that devours this plant in an evening. We know of this great storm that is quieted by a man being thrown overboard. And people hear these accounts, they read them, and they think, how can this be anything other than a story made up in the mind of man? 
But when we approach this book, it's important that we remember our commitment to Scripture. Because we as Christians do not approach Scripture trying to make God fit our reason. Uh, rather, we, fit, we approach Scripture trying to conform our reason to the Word that God has revealed to us. We believe so that we can understand, as Anselm uh, in the past has said. Uh, Jesus uh, accepts the historicity of the book of Jonah in Matthew uh, chapter 12. Uh, he gives himself, uh, he gives the people of Israel no sign other than uh, the sign of Jonah. Three days in the belly of the great fish. And when Jesus speaks of that, he speaks of the people of Nineveh being in better shape at the judgment than the people who reject Christ. He seems to be talking of true people, of real people, people of Nineveh who will... Uh, in some sense, be judged less severely than the people of Israel who reject the Christ. And so, uh, if Jesus accepts the historicity of the book of Jonah, why would we think it beyond our ability to accept it? We also have to recognize that when we come to this book, even though there are many uh, supernatural occurrences that take place in it, the primary focus of the book, as we saw this morning, is not the supernatural instances uh, themselves. This is not a book of miracles, although miracles are contained in their pages. Rather, it is a picture of Jonah, who serves as a picture of Israel, or even of us as the church, learning of the grace of God's relationship with people even outside of his immediate circle of concern, Jonah's immediate circle of concern concern, that is. It's really somewhat of a lesson like uh, the older brother in the, in the parable of the prodigal son. You remember the parable of the prodigal son, kids? What happens? The, the son comes back after he squandered everything, and he asks the father, his father to accept him again as a, as a servant, right? But the father welcomes him back and gives him a large feast, and there outside is his older brother. And this older brother thinks this younger brother is worthless. He has nothing to gain by having him in the family. And he hates it that his father has welcomed him back. This is somewhat of the lesson of Jonah. And Jonah will be uh, fulfilling the role of the older brother uh, in that parable. So we want to work our way through this book and see how we can learn from the life of Jonah. I want to give us a loose outline before we look at uh, the specifics of verses 1 through 3. This book is really structured around the two callings of Jonah. The first calling of Jonah is what we will be looking at together this evening. The second calling takes place in Jonah chapter 3. The first calling, Jonah rejects. The second calling, Jonah accepts. And he goes to the city of Nineveh after spending those three days in the belly of the great fish. And that passage of that, that time that he spends in the belly of the great fish serves as a, as a transition. And so uh, these callings, the two callings, form the, the two basic sections of this prophecy. And today what we want to do is look at the beginning of the first section, God's call on Jonah and his rejection. And so uh, just by way of these three verses is a fairly simple division. We can look at the call issued by God in the first two verses and then we can look at the call rejected by Jonah in the third verse. So the call issued by God in verses 1 and 2, and the call rejected by Jonah in verse 3. So in verse 1, we see that the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. He is, I think at this point, already a prophet, like we said in 2 Kings. He is a recognized prophet in, in the northern kingdom. And it seems that he, as a prophet, made other predictions that are not written down for us. He has, uh, as is the case with Nathan, the prophet of David, or other prophets that show up in the Old Testament, they speak specifically to the time and the place of that nation, and, and the Lord in His providence not, does not seem to find it necessary that those words be recorded. But this aspect of Jonah's life is recorded. Here the word of the Lord uh, comes to Jonah, and he does the work of the prophet. The Lord gives him his word and sends him on his way, saying to Jonah, Declare my words to the people of Nineveh. 
It's the calling of the prophet, right? The espousing of personal opinions is, is not the privilege of a prophet. The prophet's job is only to declare, thus says the Lord. Sometimes we think of the prophetic office as completely obliterated, but in, in that sense, in that declaration of thus says the Lord, the prophetic office is still very much alive and well. Every time a minister declares the Word of God in, in the centuries gone by, they would have called that prophesying. There are, are old textbooks on preaching which are called the art of prophesying. It's not prophecy as we would think of it necessarily, not new revelation that God gives to us, but uh, the revelation of the Lord written down and the man standing up before God's people and saying, this is the word of the Lord uh, for you. This is the word of the Lord. Make no mistake about it. And when the Lord's word comes to Jonah, it's actually quite simple. The Lord tells him to go to Nineveh, to prophesy in the capital of the Assyrians, and to call them uh, to repentance. Very simple, but as is often the case with the simple commandments of the Lord, it's also very hard, and it's especially so for Jonah. Uh, you remember we talked about where Jonah was from, the northern part of the northern kingdom, and he is called to prophesy against Nineveh, calling them uh, to repentance. Well, Jonah, as a prophet in the northern kingdom, is part of an apostate nation that is is near its end. Uh, Jeroboam II, he is the 13th king of the northern kingdom. It's been 140 plus years since Jeroboam I rebelled against David's line. And there are only about 40 years left until this kingdom will be carried off into exile. In fact, about one and a half years after Jeroboam's death, the Assyrians begin to come down and carry off people from the northern kingdom. So do not think to yourself that Nineveh was a faraway land for Jonah, that he knew nothing about them. Uh, the Assyrians were known, and they were known as a ruthless and hated people in the, in the nation of Israel. There's another prophecy that deals with Nineveh also. It's the prophet Nahum. In Nahum's oracle concerning Nineveh, uh, there is no calling to the people of, of Assyria for repentance, Rather, it is a declaration of the judgment, uh, the judgment of the city of Nineveh. And in the first four verses of the third chapter of Nahum, this is how the Assyrians are described, so we can get a taste of what kind of people they were. Woe to the bloody city, all full of lies and plunder. No end to the prey, the crack of the whip and rumble of the wheel, galloping horse and bounding chariot. Horsemen charging, flashing sword and glittering spear. Hosts of slain, heaps of corpses, dead bodies without end. They stumble over the bodies. And all for the countless whorings of the prostitute, graceful and of deadly charms, who betrays nations with her whorings and peoples with her charms. This is the nation that the Lord calls Jonah to prophesy against. A nation uh, on the ascendancy in power, a nation ruthless in how it conquers those around them. And God calls Jonah to prophesy to Nineveh. Jonah is sent uh, to the very center, you understand, of the enemies of the people of God. A nation that is to be their conqueror one and a half years after the death of Jeroboam uh, II is already a known entity in the lives of the people of Israel. And so the Lord sends His prophet Jonah to their seat of power, to their capital city, uh, to Nineveh. It's often the case in the Christian life as well, isn't it, that God calls us to things that we don't expect or even things that we uh, don't prefer. Uh, but God is Lord, and He calls Jonah, and He gives him direction. He does it with Jonah, and he does it with us as well. The word of the Lord in the calling of Jonah flows from who God is. Isaiah, in his 43rd chapter, speaks of his lordship. Listen to these first three verses. But now says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, who formed you, O Israel, 
Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. This is the essence of God's ownership over His people. And it's also the essence of the reassurance that we have as His people when we are called by the Lord to do those things which we may not prefer. And Isaiah continues in his prophecy, and he says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. The prophet has forgotten the prophecy, hasn't he? He's forgotten the ownership of God over his life. And he has forgotten the care of the Lord over his life. His calling as prophet of the Lord is here not pending his approval. He's not trying out for a position on a baseball team. He is to do the Lord's work and the Lord's work alone. And the Lord calls him to bear witness in Nineveh, in the city where the enemies of Israel dwell and dwell in great number. Uh, but for Jonah, that's not good enough. In verse 3, he rejects the call of the Lord. And so we want to look at that next. Jonah, a prophet, a supposed spiritual leader of the people of Israel, you would imagine as one who prophesies, uh, prophesied in the, in the northern kingdom, he hears the word of the Lord. And as one of the spiritual leaders of those nations, we would expect him to respond favorably uh, to it. But he doesn't. He flees uh, to Tarshish. In a sense, it shows us a little bit about what is important to Jonah. It, it gives us a little snapshot into his heart. He's a, he's a patriotic prophet, isn't he? He prophesies in Second Kings about the expansion of the borders of Israel, the northern kingdom, and, and it comes true. Uh, it must have been easy for him to make that prophecy because now when the Lord asks him to prophesy in favor or call the enemies of Israel to repentance, it seems to be more than he can bear. He hates Israel, Israel's enemies, and yet he is used by God to go to them, to call them to repentance. I think in some sense Jonah rightly views Israel as the chosen nation. He's not incorrect in that assumption, is he? But he has forgotten something of what the Lord has said to the people of Israel. You remember back when God gives his first promise to Abraham in, in Genesis chapter 12. He says that you will be the blessing of all nations. And Jonah has taken his eyes off that. He wishes only the blessing to fall on the people of Israel. And it's so often the case when Jonah misunderstands or distorts the promises of God, he also distorts his actions. Instead of going to Nineveh, this prophet makes a U-turn and goes in the opposite direction. Now, to understand where Nineveh is, if you take Israel, uh, Nineveh is to the north and to the east, a long way away. Jonah goes to Tarshish, which is in the south and in the west, a long way away. Tarshish, the exact location of Tarshish actually is uncertain. Some think it was somewhere in Egypt. Some think it was uh, far on the west coast of Spain. Whatever the case is, it usually is referred to as the furthest westward city that was known at that time. So Jonah is not monkeying around. He's not going halfway, is he? He's going as far away from the east as he can get. And don't forget, this likely would have been a major change for Jonah. For him to pick up and move to Tarshish is to leave behind the very nation that he is so proud of. It is to leave behind, uh, behind his house, whatever is remaining of his family. We know not if he was married or what his status was with children. But he leaves all of that behind to go to Tarshish to avoid calling the enemies of the Lord's people to repentance. 
And he does that, he goes to Tarshish with the expressed intent of fleeing, it says in verse 3, from the presence of the Lord. Now it seems from that phrase that Jonah has adopted something of the cultural understanding of the divinities of that time. Don't forget, Jonah was a prophet living in a, an idolatrous culture. Uh, the people of Israel, the northern tribes, were idolatrous, practicing idol worship of all sorts of kinds, worse uh, than the, the heathen nations around them, it says at some points in, in the, the Word of God. And so it's not surprising that he would adopt some of the thinking of the culture that is around him. And what was very common in that day is to think of gods, the gods of the different nations, as having regional powers. They were kind of the, the power brokers of a certain area. Some were over the sea, some were over this zone, this province, this country, some were over another. And Jonah seems to have adopted that about the Lord God of, of heaven and earth as well. He thinks that if he can only go far away west, he will be outside of the presence of the Lord. It is, of course, tremendously flawed, but it seems that he has adopted that which is a common practice. The kings of the, that time would sacrifice all sorts of gods, hedging their bets, so to speak, uh, that if they missed one of the gods, well, they got him here in this other sacrifice. And that seems to be the mindset of Jonah as he seeks to flee uh, from the presence of the Lord. It's repeated for us twice in verse 3 that he is seeking to flee the presence of the Lord, as if to draw special attention to his motivation in going to Tarshish. This prophet, he does not want to warn Nineveh. No, uh, Jonah wants God's judgment. He wants nothing to do with God's mercy. And so here in the beginning of this first section of the prophecy of Jonah, we see his rejection and his rebellion against the explicit command of the Lord. In a sense, these first three verses build for us a dark anticipation of what's going to happen in the rest of the book, doesn't it? I mean, we know uh, the great power and might of God. And, and in writing down Jonah's motivations, it seems almost silly for this prophet of the Lord to be seeking to run away uh, from the presence of the Lord. We're reading this story, this account, in light of, of what is taking place in, in the kingdom of Israel. Jeroboam II, he is an idolatrous king. And the northern tribes of Israel, they are an idolatrous people. They are rebelling against the Lord, against the callings of the Lord. They do not want to serve Him in the way that He would be served. They are full of rebellion. And so in these sections of Jonah, the first one we started this Lord's Day, Hopefully we will see the unquestioning rule of God over all the world, but also His mercy and His grace to man. Jonah serves as that picture. The picture of the man who understands not, he understands neither God's power nor His mercy over all people. He seeks his own ways and he seeks to conform God to His image and His plans rather than to conform His plans uh, to the Lord. So what, what do we do in light of this opening fleeing, this opening rebellion from Jonah in this short prophecy? Well, first of all, we recognize that our calling is to serve God in all our circumstances. Jonah's negative example is not necessarily unique for us as Christians, is it? We complain about our circumstances, which are given to us by God Himself. You know, when we're younger, we say, my parents are too strict. When we are older, we say, our children don't listen well enough. My job is too hard. I don't have enough money. My wife doesn't understand me. My country is immoral. All of these things may be true but they do not change our calling from the Lord. We are called to serve Him even in the circumstances that may not suit our purposes. What do we do with our failings when we recognize that we are grumbling against the Lord? 
when we recognize that God has appointed our circumstances and has, has called us to task. Well, the second part of Jonah applies. Our God is a merciful God. He is gracious to all sorts of people. And so when we see our sin in this area, we simply uh, turn to the Lord in repentance. We rest on the mercy of Christ and we cry out to Him for repentance. And we recognize and we learn for ourselves. Whatever our calling may be, the proper starting point for that calling from the Lord is not our comprehension. It is not our agreement even with the calling that God has set before us. But it is the glory of God. No matter what the circumstances in our days may be, our witness to the Lord is unchanging, and it is to, hit, to give Him glory. It is what Jonah missed, and it is what we miss so many times in so many days. But we serve a merciful God. Second thing that I think we can learn from Jonah as the rebellious minister is that God cannot be escaped. Now, we in our day don't cobble together a couple of coins and go to the nearest port city, Savannah, and get on a ship and try to make it across to Africa or some other place to flee from the presence of the Lord. We're actually much more simple than that. We think just because somebody can't see us that we are unseeable by God as well. When we do our sins in secret, we are doing exactly the same thing that Jonah does in this prophecy. Even in our thoughts, we think that we can get away with sinful thoughts because God is not there. But the truth of it is, of course, that we do everything in the presence of God. All our sins are done with Jesus Christ standing right next to us, watching, in a sense. So whatever is popping up on that computer screen of yours, you are doing that in the presence of the Lord God of heaven. So we are to live in the presence of God uh, every day. And one of the ways that we can be encouraged to live in the presence of God every day is through fellowship with His people. Maybe uh, your fellowship with the people is in a small congregation such as this. Maybe it is um, as a member of a larger congregation with a smaller group of people. But the key for us as Christians is to have uh, no secret life. To have the fellowship of the believers. Make sure that your relationship with, Lord, with the Lord is on solid footing. And then the third thing that I think we can learn from this prophecy uh, is to love to tell of God's grace to those who would seem to do your, you harm. We see horrific images. We hear of horrific news stories these days of, of Christians being beheaded by people who would do them harm. And you try to imagine, as best you can, what it would be like in that situation would you go to those people? Would you speak the truth of God's mercy to those people also? Would you call those people to repentance? Would you seek their forgiveness in the presence of God? Now, we looked this evening at the judgment of God as part of His exaltation. And we don't want to carry that out of balance because the judgment of God is, is certainly part of His exaltation, but it is only hand in hand with His mercy also. And so we come to people of all sorts with this mercy and this judgment in proper balance. In our own culture, forget about what's happening in the Middle East, but in our own culture, uh, we see somewhat of an attack against the church, don't we? A government and and organizations, making it more difficult for the Christian church to proclaim the truth, the simple truth of the gospel. And though we rejoice in God's judgment against His enemies, we would also long for the grace of God to be extended to all men. 
And so there is a simple question that we can ask ourselves to serve as some kind of a barometer to see how we're doing in that area. Are we praying regularly for the salvation of those who would persecute the church of Christ? Are we praying regularly for the salvation of those people who we would complain about so vigorously in their uh, wrong decisions that they're making in, in government? Are we praying that their souls would be in the heavenly places with us when we enter into eternity? Do we resent God for His kindness towards others, or do we seek His kindness towards others? When we have a chance to speak face to face, are we seasoned with salt in our words, even in our words towards that neighbor that's been irritating us for months? Are we willing to speak with him in such a way that he would know of the grace of God at work uh, in us? Are those who seek the harm of the church a threat to you? Or are those who seek the harm of the church a person who is in need of salvation? That is the question that Jonah is struggling with. It is the question that we struggle with in so many places. But we are to pray, we are to speak, we are to act in accord with God's grace that has been implanted in us. And so we are called as God's people to plead with Him for the salvation of all kinds of people. So for Jonah, Jonah as a picture of Israel, Jonah as a picture of the church, he is one who is called to a specific task. And as the prophecy begins, the effect of the rebellion of God's people is seen in Jonah's life. Maybe it's seen in our lives also. But we are called by God. We are sent to do His work. So as His people, let us do it, knowing that He is in our presence, no matter what we say, do, or think. Let's pray together.